Let's learn about your uterine lining and answer some of your top questions. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, so I'm a fertility doctor. And today I wanna to talk about your uterus and specifically your uterine lining, which is something you may not have thought about until you got to a stage where maybe you're trying to get pregnant. Once you are trying to get pregnant, suddenly you're gonna be going in to ultrasounds if you're going to a fertility doctor's office, and now you're gonna be thrown at this whole new terminology that you may not even know. So I'm gonna explain what we look for in ultrasound and answer some of your top questions. These are questions that you've asked on YouTube. So these are questions pulled right from the YouTube comments and tell me if you have questions. We try to answer as many as we can, we can't get to them all, but if you leave questions, we do go and pull some that we think that other people will be interested in as well. So let's go ahead and dive into talking about the uterus. I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. This channel has been growing and I'm just so constantly happy, humbled, honored that you are spending your most valuable commodity, your time here with me learning more about your body. So let's talk about the uterus. So the first thing is understanding that your uterus is responsive to different hormones. So it is something that is going to change. There are things that can highlight different issues or make us concerned and understanding one, what we're looking for helps you then understand the things that are going wrong. When we talk about the uterus, there's different layers to the uterus. So you have the outside of the uterus, which we call the serosa. You have the muscular layer of the uterus, which is the myometrium. And then you have the inside of the uterus, which is what we call the uterine lining or the endometrium. Even within the endometrium, there are layers. So there's a basal layer, which is the bottom layer. And think of that as the layer that has stem cells or is regenerative to the top layer, which is what you actually shed off or bleed. These are both very important when it comes to a pregnancy because a pregnancy, that placenta, has to invade into the uterine wall. The pregnancy has to bury in there and that placenta has to connect blood supply. It actually has to eat away a part of your uterine walls and blood vessels in order to make that maternal fetal blood supply. It's a fascinating process. But when we're evaluating the uterus, we are always trying to look at what different issues can exist and can there be issues when it comes to structural issues of the uterus. So you can have uterine birth defects called malarian anomalies. You can have fibroids or polyps. And then you can have issues where maybe the lining isn't looking like it should and maybe that's representing another problem. So when we dive in, what we are looking for, and I'm gonna go ahead and say this first question because it's perfect. Can you explain linings, trilaminar, et cetera? When we do a lining, this is measured in a particular view on an ultrasound. Remember that a transvaginal ultrasound is an ultrasound going to the vagina, looking at the uterus and the ovaries, but the uterus is a potential space, meaning I like to think about the uterus, well, imagine it's like my hands. I can't see what's inside until like something is in there or I put something in there. So when you do a saline sonogram or a hysteroscopy or an HSG, and all three of those are imaging modalities where we can see the inside of the uterus, what you're doing is putting liquid inside the uterus and pushing these walls apart. And then you can see if there's a septum, a polyp, or something abnormal. So regular vaginal ultrasound may not show you the inside of the uterus, nor is it enough to diagnose that you don't have certain abnormalities. Meaning, as a part of your infertility workup, you need an evaluation of the uterine cavity. It's not a regular ultrasound. It's either saline sonogram, water inside the uterus, HSG, or hysteroscopy. Something where we look inside. When we're talking about your lining, we are measuring it on vaginal ultrasound and we are getting a certain view called sagittal. And in this sagittal view, you can see that the uterus is having a lining growing. Now, when we look at the lining, we can look at what we would see at baseline. So if you come in for a baseline appointment, this is typically when you're on your period or before there's estrogen. This is your pre-estrogen lining. And that is typically a thinner lining and it might sometimes be irregular. It's just quite thin. When you have estrogen only, so you're going through that cycle, your estrogen is rising, you have no progesterone because you're in the follicular phase, that estrogen is going to stimulate the lining to grow, and that lining is going to grow in a very organized fashion, or it should. And that organized fashion is going to be what we call trilaminar, 
because it looks like these three white lines on ultrasound. And so if you're coming in for a lining measurement before an embryo transfer, if we're measuring the lining before an IUI cycle or ovulation induction, we are looking for a trilaminar lining and studies support that in the average person, you would like this lining to be greater than seven. It doesn't mean that six is bad or six and a half is bad, but it does mean that in the average person, you want it seven or more. And the reason why I say that is that like, we don't know what everybody's lining is when they're walking around in the wild getting pregnant, but statistically in a population seven and greater have higher odds of pregnancy. Now your lining then is going to look what we call homogenous after it sees progesterone. And so once you have progesterone, it changes the lining. It goes from this organized trilaminar compact it, to it compacts, it changes, it compresses itself. It gets ready for that pregnancy to come and implant. We know that progesterone opens and closes that implantation window. So that's why the start of progesterone is so critically important for when you're gonna go and do the timing of the transfer. Because if you've had too long of progesterone, it's not gonna work. Too short of progesterone, not going to work. But this is why you can come in and I can look at your uterus and very often can tell where you are in your cycle based on the lining alone. So homogenous, progesterone, trilaminar, estrogen. And then of course, things like scar tissue, polyps, fibroids can cause irregularities inside the uterus that might distort what the lining should actually look like. All right, another question is that someone has fluid in their lining while on estrace, but it clears up once PIO or progesterone in oil is started. Is it still safe to do the embryo transfer? Is still trilaminar and thick enough, just not sure about the fluid. When we're doing a frozen embryo transfer, this means you've gone through IVF, taken eggs out of the body, fertilized them in the lab and made embryos. Now we are looking to put that embryo back in your body at the appropriate time. And we're controlling a lot of different variables. So this person is using what we call a controlled or a medicated cycle. So you're not ovulating, your ovaries are not making new hormones, we're giving you all the hormones. And in this case, you're taking estrace, which is a pill of estradiol, which is structurally just like the estrogen that the ovaries make. Fluid can come between the lining for a variety of different reasons. Most commonly is due to disruption in blood supply within the uterus, and this can be from prior uterine surgery. So classically, this person has had a C-section, fibroids removed, or some type of surgery inside the uterus. Occasionally, it is just your body's response to estrace. Estrace is different. It gets metabolized a little bit differently than estradiol from the ovary. If you start progesterone and the lining still compacts and the fluid goes away, I'm not worried about it and I would still transfer on it. If I see fluid, I really wanna measure the lining above and below. One thing I see is sometimes people measure the whole lining with the fluid and they're not accounting for the lining's not actually thick enough. If the fluid doesn't go away after starting progesterone, then that's not gonna be a good situation to transfer. So you would want to cancel the cycle. What do you do in that circumstance? The two kind of arms, hysteroscopy, put a camera in the uterus and see what is going on. Could there be scar tissue or something distorting uterine anatomy? Next could be try a different protocol. And these notably are either going to be a modified natural where your body is going to grow a lining naturally by causing you to ovulate and then that ovary is gonna make estrogen or by a longer suppressive protocol, maybe with more Lupron or other anti-inflammatories in case that helps. And then can you explain taking melatonin to help with the uterine lining? Should it be taken every night in the cycle or just in the luteal phase? So melatonin promotes uterine health. We actually know that based on studies, especially a lot of animal studies, but it's actually a supplement that I recommend to the majority of my patients. There are some caveats. The reason why melatonin can be helpful is that people who have low circulating melatonin levels have a dysfunction in their circadian rhythm. But we've also seen lower implantation rates or higher rates of infertility, concerned that there could be some layer of impact of melatonin on uterine receptivity. The thought is that melatonin is a potent antioxidant is one way. So if melatonin is an antioxidant that can promote a lower inflammatory environment, which can lead to a healthier implantation and a healthier placenta. 
there are melatonin receptors inside the uterine lining as well. And that's why we think that melatonin may impact here because the endometrium has melatonin receptors and why would it have that if it wasn't an important component? If we step back, I think it's probably part of the entire stress response. You know, if you can get enough sleep, you have good circadian rhythm, then that's helpful for your body to say, hey, we're in a good spot to have a pregnancy. Melatonin's also been helpful for people who have other inflammatory diseases like endometriosis. There's been some literature on that. I recommend that patients take it every day and every night, and I recommend that you actually take it and be very mindful of the dose. So one thing we see is that sometimes people will be taking a very high dose of melatonin. I recommend 300 micrograms MCGs a night. What you'll see often is 10 milligrams, 30 milligrams. There's just this American mentality that more is more. You don't want to have so much that your own brain won't make melatonin if you need to, which is what so many of these supplements do. But a physiologic level to just support when your body should have natural melatonin in addition to good sleep hygiene, even in people who report having good sleep can actually help decrease inflammation. And we can see that in the uterus, there's melatonin receptors and that this is an important con contributor. So I don't say just luteal phase. I recommend that you do it throughout your entire time trying to conceive. And I hope that helped answer a few of your questions about understanding the uterine lining and the uterus just a little bit better. As a reminder, we're answering your questions. So leave questions in this video and elsewhere and we will get to them. As always, you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or learn more on the As Woman podcast. Thanks friends.